I'm Julie Herman of Jaybird Quilts and welcome back to the Alphabet Soup Sew Along. I hope you have enjoyed our lesson so far. Today we're going to take all the information we have learned in the previous lessons and put that together to make the name quilt. The name quilt is exactly as it sounds, a quilt with your name on it. This here behind me is a work in progress of the quilt for my son William. So using the information in the other lessons, I went ahead and fussy cut my pieces, pieced my letters together, and then determined spacers. If you need help figuring out the spacers that go between your letters, download the spacer guide. In that PDF, I give you 76 different examples of names and what spacers I suggest. If you don't yet have that file, go ahead and sign up in the caption below for the sew along and you'll get that file in your email. To do this quilt, you'll also need one more file, which is the bonus name quilt. You'll get that when you sign up for the sew along as well. So jumping right on in, the essential components of a name quilt are the letters of the name, you're gonna have small pieces above and below, and then you're gonna have large pieces above and below. In the pattern, I suggest using a wide back since there's a large variety of them that have large scale prints that don't work as well cut up. This example is the quilt I made for my son, Nate, who now prefers to be called Nathan and has requested that I make him a new one, of course. So as you see in this one, I used Tula Pink's uh, monkey wrench and I use the don't slip. So these bananas are so large, they're similar in size, you know, closer to the letters, they wouldn't work fussy cut, you wouldn't get to see them. I'm going to be using the blue and purple version of that same fabric for Williams. So I'm going to follow the directions in the pattern to cut the top and bottom pieces. And then Nathan has requested this gorgeous fabric um, Tula Pink's Ladybugs for his new quilt that has his full name, Nathan. Today we're going to work on piecing our letters together with our spacers and then adding these pieces. And it might be hard to imagine, but when I piece all of this together, I'm actually going to lose seven inches, I counted, based off of how many spacers I have. So that's why it looks like my top and bottom aren't long enough right now. William is one of the names that is longer. Most of the names will fit into a square quilt that will be 50 and a half inches wide. William is gonna be 60 and a half inches. Some names are even longer and that information is in the name spacer guide. Since William's is 60 and a half inches, I'm gonna need these top and bottom pieces to be 60 and a half inches. Most fabric is between 40 and 42 inches on the bolt, so not big enough. So what I did was I cut three strips in this case, and since my pieces were 42 inches, I have enough fabric that I can piece a diagonal seam. So I'm gonna go ahead, cut that on the diagonal, cut this one on the diagonal as well. It's less noticeable and it's a little bit stronger. And then another tip that I learned once um, is when you are piecing two of them like this to not have them directly on top of each other. So I could have flipped this and had the seams directly on top of each other, but instead I'm gonna have one over here and one over here so that it's less noticeable in the finished quilt. I'm gonna head on over to the machine to begin piecing my spacers to my letters. So I'm starting with my first letter and my side filler. You always want to sew with your letter on top of your side filler or on top of your sashing. And that's gonna look like this with your letter on top. And that is so we can sew our quarter inch here and make sure that we don't lose this point. In case something is off with your seam allowance here, you can be a little more generous or a little less if needed and keep an eye on that point. If we sewed it like this, we wouldn't be able to see where that point is and we could possibly flip these seams because we can't keep an eye on them. So I am going to put it this way. I'm not going to pin. If you feel more comfortable pinning, you can. And I'm also not going to backstitch at the beginning and the end because we are going to be putting the borders on the top and the bottom. But if you would like to backstitch, you can go ahead. So I just got that lined up here and here. I'm just gonna go nice and slow. This is a good opportunity if you have a stiletto to use that to keep your seams nice and down exactly how you want them. And now I can move on to my next letter with my next sashing, or if you think you're gonna get things mixed up, just go ahead and build your strip one piece at a time. That way you're sure you're definitely not gonna mix anything up. And nothing needs to be pressed at this point because nothing is intersecting this. So I'm going to sew 
all of my pieces on and then do all of my pressing at the same time. So I'm going to take my next piece and normally we would sew with the smaller item on top, which would be this, but we wanna keep our letter on top. So we're gonna flip it upside down and sew it just as we did the first one. Now you may have a combination of letters that does not require any of the sashing, such as an A to a Y. If that's the case, I pick which letter has the least number of points and I put that one on the bottom. There's an example of a combination of letters without sashing that I will show you in a couple days when we sew the baby quilt. For my son William's name, there was sashing needed between all the letters. So now I have this one and I'm just gonna put my letter on top. And there's also a good um, opportunity here. Make sure you double check. Some letters, such as an I, can be rotated. And while yes, the quilt can still be read this way, if you took time to fussy cut and you wanted the fruit or whatever you fussy cut to be upright, you'll want to make sure that you don't get things flipped. It's very easy to turn things around. So taking a minute or two for a double check is always helpful. So I'm just gonna continue as I did the first few. I'm gonna speed this up for you. So as you can see, I'm continuing to add the sashing pieces and piece them to the letters, always with the letter on top, and repeat this process down the length of the entire word. So as you can see here, you can see a little bit of my purple fabric that is my sashing is showing up because this was not perfectly straight on the side of this L, but as a result of having it on top, I can make sure that I don't lose that point and to just fix that little mistake in my seam allowance here and no one will ever know that it's here. When I find something that needs extra attention, I take out my stiletto, I slow down a little bit. Now that I have completed the word, it's time to make my border so I can go ahead and press them as well when I go ahead and press my name. Now I've already cut one side at 45 degrees. I can go ahead and cut the other side or I can just lay it on top, make sure that they're square as if you were piecing two binding strips. That's what it should kind of feel very similar to. And go ahead and piece them right here on that seam. And I'm gonna repeat that for the bottom strip as well. I'm gonna go ahead and trim off my excess and then I'm gonna head over to the iron to press everything that I have sewn. Now that I have the name sewn, it's time to go ahead and press. And so far I have suggested pressing open and generally that's my rule of thumb. But in this case, I'm going to press the seams to the side fillers and to the sashing. There's a lot of things going on with the blocks so it just makes more sense to press to the sashing. I'm just gonna simply push a little bit just to make sure that I've got it where it needs to be. But I don't wanna iron, I want to press. Ironing is pushing, pressing, is up and down with a little wiggle. As you can see, there's no weight here whatsoever. When you push, you can stretch the bias. And we have a lot of pieces here that are cut on the bias. And depending on how you fussy cut things, you still might have bias along the top and the bottom of the letters. So you wanna be extra careful to not stretch that. So make sure that you are pressing and not ironing. So the only time I'm using any pressure is just the first time that I'm kind of pushing the seam to the side because sometimes if you don't give any pressure, it kind of wants to curve back over 
I'm kind of exaggerating it here, but you can end up with like a little bit of a pocket underneath here. Um, so I just want to, I can either do it with my finger or with the iron. I just want to press it. I just want to give it a little bit of a push before I press. And here with the eye, since this letter is so small, when I go to press this one, I'm going to naturally want to press this one as well because of the size of the iron. So since I pressed this one, I'm going to go ahead and press this one and then I'll save those two that are really close together for after I've gotten the outside ones done. I find that the less seams I'm pressing at a time, the better that they look. If I try and press, like if I tried to press all four of these at one time, inevitably I'd have one of those pockets or something would get a little messed up. So I like to press the outside ones and then move to the inside. And when I press my seams open, I press from the back and then I press from the front. You can do the pressing right now from the back and then move to the front if you prefer. You can work this way. Um, I find since the front is the part that I'm going to be looking at and I'm not needing to see the seam to press it open, that I have the most success pressing from this side. But you do what is the most comfortable for you. So I'm just going to speed this up a little bit and continue pressing in the same manner until I finish pressing all of the name. Now that I have this done, I'm going to set this aside and I'm going to press my top and bottom border pieces. I just have one small area to press on each of these and in this case I am going to press this open. Um, that way it's going to lay as flat as possible because the idea is that you don't see this seam. We're going to do what we can to hide it. So now that I have this pressed, I need to go ahead and cut these down to length. And according to my pattern, they should be 60 and a half inches long based off of the fact that this William name is 60 and a half inches long. But as you know, not all things are always as they should be. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to measure and whatever measurement my length of my name strip is, is the measurement I'm going to use to cut those border pieces. I'm over here at my cutting mat and one thing you may or may not notice is that I almost always have the side with the grid facing down. So a couple reasons for that. Every brand of mat is different and I have found over the years that these measurements are not nearly as accurate as the measurements on an acrylic ruler. An acrylic ruler cannot shrink or change with heat or different elements and the mats can. And also the printing on the mats for some reason is just not as accurate I found as the rulers. I also find the lines can be distracting when I'm using specialty rulers like my Sidekick, Hexamore, Fussy Cut Shapes and so on and I tend to use those more than anything. So I like to use the back of the mat. You can use both sides. In this case I flipped it over to the grid because I'm going to use the grid as my friend right now. And I'm going to use the grid to help me measure. So I am going to fold this in half and I'm going to use these lines to help me measure. So since this is, should be 60 and a half inches, if I take the fold to the zero, it should go to 30 and a quarter. Let's see, where does it go? That is almost perfectly on 30 and a quarter. I'm actually really proud of myself. It does not always work out as well as you would hope. So that means that I do need to cut both of my border strips to be 60 and a half. So I'm gonna do the same thing with them, which is fold them in half. And line it up. Line up my fold on my zero line. And then I'm just simply going to cut at 30 and a quarter. And that will give me 60 and a half. So you want to cut your border pieces the same length as your name strip, whatever that happens to be for the name that you are working on. So there's one of mine. And here's the other, line that up, line it up here, measure twice, cut once, especially with something like this, you don't want to have to recut, so double check. 
Now that I have these cut, I want to go ahead and pin them to my name. So I'm gonna finger press in this half mark so that I have a point that I know that I can use. And I'm also going to do quarter marks as well. And if you find that you don't see your finger press seams, go ahead and mark your fold with a pin. Either one of the methods works. If you're folding multiple layers, just make sure that the pin only goes through one layer so that you'll be able to open up your strip. And I'm gonna repeat that with the name. So I'm gonna give it a little bit of a finger press and put a pin here. And I'm gonna fold to find my quarter marks as well. And that way when I go to pin my border to my piece, I have some places to reference there's not specific um, cornerstones or sashing or things that we're gonna be matching up. They're just solid border pieces. And if you don't pin, which I generally don't pin a lot of things, but I do pin borders. If you don't pin, often by the time that you get to the end, you've either stretched your border a little bit or you stretch your piece and then you end up with that kind of wavy look. And depending on your quilter, they may or may not be able to get that out for you. Um, they probably won't be happy either way. So I do my best to avoid those situations. So now that I have those pins, I'm gonna open this up. Let's see if this is my top or my bottom. Remember I talked about having the sashing sp seams split and I did make sure that I fussy cut these little frogs so I didn't have like half a frog in my border piece. So since this one has the seam here, this is my top. So I'm just going to match up the pins or your folds, whichever way you decided to go. And I'm gonna put a couple pins in from this side, but then I'm gonna do the rest of the pinning from the other side because just how we, when we were sewing our sashing, to our letters we wanted to sew with our letter on top and our sashing below all the time. The same holds true for our borders to our finished piece. We wanna sew with our name on top and with our border below. So I'm gonna put one more pin and then flip this over and put more pins in from this side and repeat to add the other one. Now that I've put the pins in this side, I am gonna flip it over and take out the pins on the other side so that when I'm sewing, I don't have to worry um, at the machine that I might accidentally sew over them because I forget that they're there because they're on this side. I'm going to sew on both of my border pieces, and as I mentioned, I'm sewing with the letters on top and my border pieces below. I am going to backstitch at the beginning and end of each of these seams as there will not be side borders put onto this quilt. Simply gonna start, give a little backstitch, and then sew down the length of my piece, nice and slow. No hurry, don't wanna rush anything. Don't wanna stretch anything. Use my stiletto as needed to make sure that my seams stay either pressed to the sashing or open. And just sew down the length of the piece. Gonna remove my pins as I go. You never wanna sew over pins. Um, it's bad for your machine. You can break your needle. Broken pins can fly up at you. It's 
all over not good so either make sure your pins are far enough over from your needle or if they're not like mine make sure you take them out as you go and I keep an eye on where my points are of my blocks and make sure that whenever possible my needle goes right in at the point even if that means that sometimes I have a slightly more generous or a slightly less generous than a quarter inch seam it's important to me that I retain all my points you never want to have less than an eighth of an inch seam uh, less than an eighth of an inch um, can result in unraveling and in loss of structure within the quilt itself but you can get away with under a quarter here and there when needed but usually for me it's only a hair here and there So as I mentioned, I'm going to backstitch at the beginning and at the end. And then I'm going to go ahead and sew the other border piece on. Just as I pressed my blocks to the sashing and didn't press those seams open, I'm going to do the same thing here and I'm going to press everything to the border. There's just a lot of bulk in the letters and it's just easier to press here to the border. One quick note is that I generally do press with steam. Um, I really like steam. I think it helps to lay things nice and flat. Um, I don't generally have it on when I'm recording because it tends to fog up the camera. But if you like pressing with steam, I highly recommend pressing with steam. And when I'm moving along the piece here, just giving a little wiggle, not using pressure just using the weight of the iron itself. If I gave pressure, I could possibly still stretch things, even though we're dealing with less bias at this point. So I can show you with just my fingers, just using the weight of the iron, not really using the weight of my hand to push the way you might if you were ironing clothes or ironing a quilt back. And now that I have my name pressed, it's time to head on over back to my cutting mat so that I can cut my top and bottom feature pieces. Now that it's time to cut my top and bottom focus pieces, you wanna make sure you double check that this measurement is what you cut your two sashing pieces. And if it's not 50 and a half or 60 and a half, whatever yours happens to be, that you write it down on your paper so that you make sure that you cut your pieces to the proper length. The last thing you wanna do is have this gorgeous wide back and cut it to the wrong length. So I know that I need 60 and a half. Cutting a wide back can feel intimidating. They're 108 inches long as opposed to the standard 42 to 44. Um, so you have a lot of fabric to be working with. I have two yards here, which is what I need for a quilt that is going to be 60 inches wide. And what I did is I folded it along the selvage and then I'm gonna fold it one more time. And that's going to make it small enough to cut on my cutting mat without the additional folds. Um, it would be really difficult to cut it on a standard size cutting mat. So I'm just gonna put the bulk of my fabric over here to my left. I am right-handed and I'm just gonna double check my fold, make sure everything stays lined up. And that way I know that my fold up here and my fold down here are square to each other. And the first piece that I need to cut is my bottom, which is 10 and a half inches. And there's this banana I spotted here and I wanna make sure that I do my best to keep the banana in there. The one that doesn't have the peel, I really like what it looks like. So I'm actually gonna take two straight rulers. If you have two straight rulers, that can be helpful here. And I'm gonna line up one and I know that I need a piece that's 10 and a half, and this is only six. So I'm gonna take my second ruler and lay out four and a half. And then this is visually gonna give me what I'm gonna be working with. I'm not gonna actually use it to cut exactly like this, but 
you know, if you wanted, if I had more fabric here, you could go down, you could go up. If you wanted to focus on something, I think this is actually going to work out pretty well. My banana is kind of pretty nice and centered. And then you just want to make sure that you are, let me turn it so you can see, um, it, that your folds are square and you'll know that if you have a straight line along your ruler up here and down here, if one of those is off, I'm exaggerating, but what if one of those is off, then your folds are not perfectly square and you wanna take a moment to adjust if necessary because you wanna make sure these pieces are as square as possible before doing any cutting. And now I'm, I'm gonna rotate this around and there is a lot of fabric we're working with here so I'm just gonna kind of bunch up the rest of it and rotate this around. And now I want to cut this to be 10 and a half inches. So you got a couple of options. You can use two rulers if you have two. Count out to make sure that you get to 10 and a half. Suggest using rulers if possible and not your mat because as I already mentioned, your mat is just unfortunately not as accurate. If you happen to only have one ruler, um, another option is you can use your Super Psychic ruler. So to use your Super Psychic ruler, you want a total of 10 and a half inches. So here I have six, which means I want four and a half from here. So I'm gonna take my four and a half inch line and line that up and line this up and double check again that I am square and cut. And one more thing to keep in mind, not that accuracy doesn't matter at this point, but if you happen to cut this at 10 and a quarter or 10 and three quarters, it's okay. It is just the piece that is going to go underneath your name. It doesn't actually matter if it is exactly the size that um, was planned. What's more important is that the length is correct. So we need to make sure that this matches, which we already figured out in my case is 60 and a half. So I'm going to lay this. That's why I still do have the, the ruler side up. And I'm gonna lay this on my zero and then trim it at my 30 and a quarter. And then I know that I have exactly the right length that I need. So again, measure twice, cut once. So this is the piece that's gonna go underneath my name. And now I need to cut my larger piece that is going to go above my name. And this one is going to be 28 and a half, which can be a little bit hard to cut um, because of the size. But I will show you how I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna keep it folded, double folded how I had it. And again, keep in mind, this doesn't need to be exact. Um, you know, if this ends up being 28 and three quarters, that's okay. What's the key right here is that it's square. You wanna make sure that you're cutting a rectangle um, with 90 degree angles and that you're not cutting things crooked um, because that will make your final piece turn out crooked, but it doesn't matter that it is, it is exactly the size that you see in the pattern. So I've got everything laid out flat and a couple of choices here. Because most of us do not have a square 28 and a half inch ruler, I don't even have one that big. Um, if you have two rulers, you can line up this one on what you think is 28 and a half based off of the cutting mat. And then you can take another long ruler and put it this way as a double check and cut that way. Or at this point, you can just trust the lines on your mat. Um, I can see here though, that in lining up my ruler to my mat, as I mentioned, they're not as accurate, the mat as the, the ruler. And if I cut with just the mat, looks like I'd be about an eighth of an inch short. Not the end of the world, something this size, um, but when you're cutting detailed for piecing, it matters. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm using the length of this one combined with this one, but if you don't have that, it's okay to just use your mat. And now I have a piece left that should be somewhere in the range of 63 by 72. And this is going to be my backing. 
um, for my quilt, which mine is gonna finish at 50 and a half by 60 and a half. So this is perfectly sized to be my backing. So I'm gonna set this aside. And now I need to trim this piece down to also be the same 60 and a half inches in length. So since it is now 20, since it is now 28 and a half inches in this direction, it's too long for my 24 by 36 mat. So I unfolded it from the one way and I'm refolding it this way. So now I have a fold here and a fold here and I'm gonna trim my raw edges off so that this ends up being 60 and a half inches long. So again, I'm gonna cut on my 30 and a quarter line. One last double check. And now to attach this to my name strip, I'm gonna do something that feels very similar to what I did to put the borders on in the first place, which is I'm going to fold this in half, fold it in quarters, find those points, and head on over to the machine to sew these last two pieces on. After I get these pinned in place, I'm gonna head on over to the sewing machine and sew these in place just as I sewed on the borders. It's even easier to sew these on because you don't have to worry about any of the seams from the letters, just two long straight seams. And then I'll head on over to the iron to press these. Depending on the choice of fabrics that you have, you can choose to press these either towards the borders or towards the feature fabric. In this case, since my feature fabric is lighter than my border, I'm going to choose to press to the border. So here's my completed quilt top for my son, William. I hope he loves it as much as I do. I had a lot of fun making this. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments or over on our Jaybird Quilt Sew Along Facebook page. I'll be back here in a few days to go over how to do the baby quilt from Alphabet Soup. See you soon.